It has some kind of nanoparticle, which is called a nano uh, assembler, meaning it uses body um, materials to make its uh, network of fibers. Okay. And I compared it to, we had a sample of a meteorite, which was uh, supposed to be from Mars, I believe, and that meteorite uh, did not match the composition of what the fibers were. It was like the someone who had uh, Morgellons touched the meteorite and gave Morgellons to the meteorite <laughs> and, the, you know, the fiber, the nano arrays used uh, the building materials of what it was associated with, which was on that meteorite. So it's kind of like a parasite then. Uh, well, it would be, um, if you want to call it a man-made parasite, but it has, uh, we sent early samples and photographs to uh, the secretary and president of the American Society of Parasitology, and the secretary wrote us back and said that, one, it is not a parasite, two, it is not eukaryotic cells, three, it's not biological, and four, it is... Uh, is man-made. And what's the truth? So, so, pardon? so it is man-made, but it's well, not a parasite. If you, if you look at, and you look at the results that were received from MIT and Lambda Labs, if you can imagine, um, I, I live in the Los Angeles area where there's a very famous uh, Korean drink which is made out of boba, uh, which is tapioca, uh, putting a little, um, you know, round uh, tapioca mm -hmm. balls. Anyway, they have very large straws. If you put that straw with another straw inside of it, you have the two-part polyester resin, and just put a silicone head, which is like a Tootsie Pop, on the head of it, and that's what you have. All of those fibers that were identified, which we called fibers, which when we did a scanning electron microscope and Raman uh, test, which was micro-Raman, which we tested between 1 and 20 nanometers, um, it showed that it was a two-part polyester. All right. So that has mm -hmm. to be, be created by, by man somehow. I, I well, it a... has to be because it all had uniform shape. Right. And it had uniform array, uniform pattern. Another thing that uh, is new information, um, Dr. Carju, who had a patient uh, recently that uh, was exposed to it and had like a fiber or something going on their cheek and then had it isolated. He isolated a, like a string, if you can imagine a straw, with pellets inside of it, which was polyester crystals, which are very much like liquid polyester crystals. That confirms the polyester that we found. But the thing is, Doctor, that, that these fibers are attaching themselves and then growing in human skin. What about the well, number... Well, let me, let me go. They're growing in human skin, meaning they're coming out of the skin. Yeah. I personally, from uh, interviewing numerous people and also observing it, they have to, to make a crystal of silica or any of the other crystals go to a a silicone or a gelatinous mass, it has to have a pH of 10 and 11, and a pH, the only two organs that have that is the intestinal tract and the kidneys. So that means that this material has to go inside the body and grow outward. Oh, man, Ooh. that is really sci-fi. So what we're seeing on the outside, uh, these individuals that have this, it is literally ripping through their skin and tissue, and that's what they feel. And if you put a, a piece of steel wool or a, a, just a little wood sliver or a sand spur in your skin, that bothers you until you get it out. So if you have this all under your skin, little granules, uh, it's very annoying. Doctor, is that why uh, many Morgellons victims report that they feel like there's little microscopic bugs crawling under their skin. One lady, Vera Gallagher in California, actually took a knife and tried to cut her skin open to remove what she thought were bugs under her skin. Right. Um, I don't know that individual, but that would explain why many people uh, do have this effect because this material, this uh, nanomaterial, has an affinity for, once it comes out of the those organ systems that have the high pH, which is alkaline, so it can make the gel, it goes to the peripheral nervous system, which is just underneath the skin. So it's where it's on the baby nerves. So you're going to feel everything. 
Oh, those poor people. So now the the other thing is these people they have these real symptoms. Mm -hmm. They are scratching. Their skin looks. They're they're real symptoms. Let me interrupt you, Kate. Meaning we have a questionnaire that Dr. Spencer and I use. There's 167 symptoms, and when we get a patient, they're lacking only three of those symptoms. But all of the patients that we've seen, they continually have basically all of the symptoms. And they are, if they go to someone else, though, these poor people, and many, of, many people who are going to be watching this tonight may have heard of this, or they may even have some kind of symptoms. They go to a regular GP. What happens to them? Well, a lot of them get misdiagnosed. A lot of them uh, get uh, thought of that it's all in their mind. Right. Um, some of the ones that had, um, I'm going to say, good response to the medical professional were ones that went to, like, occupational physicians early on that understood a chemical reaction. Uh, and the other thing is that a lot of them are getting treated, you know, for parasites when they don't have parasites. And sometimes these medications work with the individual or appear to be working is because they these medications are made up of high metals with charges, valence charges, that interact with those uh, transitional metals. Oh, so, so it stops the process. It appears like it's gone or appears like it's working, but it still comes back because no one has stopped the, as I call it, the assembler, wherever it set up camp and making this continually happen. When you say assembler, that sounds like a robot or something. It's a good place well, to take a break. Well, the term is, the when correct we... term in the literature is called nanorobot. Perfect. We're going to leave that as, a, as, a, as we go into a commercial break. And when we come back, we'll ask you to explain that to our viewers. Hang on, everybody. Dr. Hildy will be right back. Okay, before we get back to the nano robot question, our assistant producer asked, have there ever been any cases that you're aware of where infants would have been born with this? Say their mother had it or something. Have you ever uh, dealt I, with I do. I have not worked directly with uh, any, but I do know that there has been some babies born with it. Um, and this was um, told to me by Shoshana Allison, who's been my immediate uh, person to collect all the information. Yes. Shame. Uh, can you imagine being a little baby and dealing with this? Wait, you've got something on your cheek here. <laughs> well, stop it. Now, tell us about these nanorobots. Well, nanorobots are uh, either they can be, um, in this case, more like uh, chemical-made um, materials, which have a specific function. Uh, this is very similar to uh, what we've experienced in everyday life as memory foam in our beds. It always goes back into a certain position. Uh, with nanorobots, uh, they uh, go into a certain area. They're programmed uh, to go in there, made to go into there, and only do one function or multiple functions. And in this case, uh, make a network that is very similar to a fiber optic network. So let's, within the body. So let's get so okay fiber optics and you earlier said something about silicone. Now has there ever been any relationship? I, I'm sure people would wonder. Okay, if somebody had like say silicone breast implants, because that could that have any bearing on this? Yes, this could because it could be a, a media to grow in. But the the individuals that we have tested that had the uh, silicone and the silica crystals. They did not have any breast implants. They did not have any type of um, prosthetic or anything that could be related to silicone or silica. Mm -hmm. 